You know, I immediately love the familiarity of this story, this Palm Sunday narrative. It's one of those Bible stories that I've sort of grown up with and I've known and loved since childhood. I had it taught to me in Sunday school. I have distinct memories of my parents reading to me from a tatty little golden book about the donkey and how special he felt being chosen by Jesus. Uh, And I have really lovely memories of going to church with my grandparents, of being involved as an altar boy in palm processions and holding palm crosses and singing right on, right on in majesty. So for me, at least, it's a Christian feast day that's so full of warm and nostalgic feelings. And from a theological perspective, it's very familiar to me as well. I've got this sort of uh, every sermon of every preacher I've ever heard on Palm Sunday have all sort of mushed into one in my memory. And it's like one sort of big blob of a sermon. So it's, it's all super nostalgic and familiar. The problem with this level of familiarity, though, is I find myself taking today a bit for granted. I sort of coast on a wave of liturgical nostalgia, and I almost miss the point of what the Bible's trying to say to me. So in preparing for this sermon, I read and reread the story of Palm Sunday, and I realised I had sort of missed two important aspects of it. And as you do these days, I did a bit of poking around on Google, And I found out that a whole bunch of other folks had missed these two things as well. The first thing to notice that is often overlooked in our story this morning is the crowds. Have you ever paid much attention to them? We really ought to, because they're an integral part of the story. Now our Gospel reading tells us that Passover week had just begun, which meant that hundreds of thousands of faithful Jewish pilgrims had flooded into Jerusalem. At that time in history, the Jews were desperate, utterly desperate for their Messiah to appear, and they held a belief that he would uh, free them from Roman oppression, most probably through a revolution. Jesus had become extremely famous in the latter months of his ministry. Huge crowds of people followed after him to hear him preach or to catch a glimpse of one of his miracles. Rumours abounded that he might be the Messiah. The problem was that the majority of people didn't want the kind of Messiah that Jesus was. They wanted a political or warrior Messiah, the Arnold Schwarzenegger of Messiahs, who might storm the Roman Empire and release the Jews from their oppression. But what God had ordained was vastly different from the expectations of the people. Instead of a warrior king leading Israel through military victory, Jesus was a prince of peace. He would indeed set captives free, but the freedom he would buy was released from the eternal consequences of sin. His salvation that he would offer was far more valuable than deliverance from earthly oppression, however horrible that may have been. It was God's eternal plan to send his only son to be the only sinless man, to die and rise again in the place of sinful humanity. Even Jesus' own disciples struggled immensely with this concept. We can see that throughout the Gospels. And the idea to them that God might have appointed the Messiah to be the suffering servant that we hear about from Isaiah was a challenge for them. If you recall, a few weeks ago, Jill preached about Peter's uh, confession that Jesus was the Christ. And only a couple of sentences later, Jesus rebukes him and calls him Satan and accuses him of having his mind on earthly things and not on heavenly things. In other words, Jesus is saying, you've got your mind on this earthly warrior Messiah. You haven't got your mind on what God's plan is. So back in our reading today, the crowds, they do meet Jesus with sheer jubilation, don't they? They shout, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king, which of course is a form of highest praise. Even mentioning a Messiah or a king, though, was a dangerous idea. It could have been seen as an act of sedition or rebellion against Rome which is very dangerous because the Roman emperor insisted on total authority in his conquered lands because he thought he was a god. The problem is that in the space of just under a week, these crowds would turn on Jesus in the most horrific fashion. Now, I did more poking around on Google, and I found that there's a popular trend among modern theologians 
to argue that the crowds represented here on Palm Sunday are a totally different group of people to the crowds on Good Friday, which is the traditionally held theological view. Now, you're all grown-up adults and very well-educated and mature Christians. You can make up your own mind. It's not that important. But I can't find much traction in the Bible for that theory. And I think it's a little bit on the illogical side because we're told the Palm Sunday crowds are there for the Passover festival. So if they all suddenly leave to be replaced by people with a seething hatred for Jesus, they'll miss the festival they turned up for. In any case, I think it's a reflection of how intrinsic and all-encompassing the brokenness of the fall is on our human natures. It's almost built into us to sin and hurt each other and betray each other. This is especially true for leaders in the political sphere, which Jesus had inadvertently become. You only have to look at the Rudd versus Gillard and Abbott, Abbott versus Turnbull malarkey of federal parliament in the last few years to see how damaging it can be. As soon as a political leader doesn't fulfil the expectations of the people, their heads go on the chopping block. Even those trusted advisers can become bitter rivals. Now, I'm almost certain that everyone in this church this morning will have experienced that on a small scale in our personal lives. The sting and pain of being betrayed is a horrible feeling which can leave deep emotional wounds. And I don't say that to just dredge up bad feelings because I'm a mean minister. I just want to make an example of pointing out how much worse it must have been for Jesus, who faced those horrendous feelings on a scale of thousands of people. The crowds had figured out Jesus was not going to lead a revolution and they turn on him pretty quickly. And we see the fruit of their wicked desires on Good Friday when they beg Pilate to release Barabbas, who was a renowned revolutionary and rebel against Rome. It's clear from the text that the people wanted a revolution and they'd call anyone Messiah if he was willing to give it. Of course, Jesus is God. So he foreknew that all of this would happen. It was part of the divine plan. The proof of his foreknowledge is seen in the fact that he knew the exact and minute details of the donkey he sent his disciples to collect. He knew things that, quite frankly, are utterly impossible for a normal mortal human to know. And he, in the process of doing that, fulfilled the centuries-old prophecy of Zechariah. So he's got a double whammy of evidence for his foreknowledge. It's at this point in writing my sermon that I got a very heavy heart. As it dawned on me that in a similar way we betray Christ every time we choose to love our sins more than we love him. And then I was marvelled by the grace of God because he already knew that and he chose to die for us anyway. To me... That's an immense comfort and a mind-bending privilege to know that even though I am a sinner, a horrible sinner, I fail Jesus a hundred different ways in a week, he still chose to die for me and to enable a way through faith in him that I could have a relationship with God and share an eternal life. It's radical, radical grace. The second thing that people often overlook in this story on Palm Sunday is the entry itself kind of easy to miss because it's just sort of there it happens jesus rides into jerusalem on the back of a donkey and uh, theologians down through the ages have labeled this event the triumphal entry and they sort of pitch it as a coronation event i guess for jesus but i i don't think it's a coronation event at all it's less of a coronation parade and more of a, a death march you see jesus is entering jerusalem with the full knowledge it's the last time he will enter that city before he dies he knows what he's there to do now yes it's true middle eastern kings rode donkeys as a sort of form of royal symbolism on their coronation day and jesus is of course king of the universe but i like what american pastor and theologian john MacArthur has labeled palm sunday he calls it the false coronation of the true king you see, there are certain almost universal elements to any sort of coronation ceremony, from the most distant tribes to the Queen of England. And uh, 
people sort of have to be loyal to their monarch. And that happens for a little while with Jesus, but as we've just discussed, it fades away very quickly. Furthermore, there's usually a parade, which is why there's that idea that it gets labelled the triumphal entry. But Jesus himself is anything but triumphant in the text. Here, he comes to face the sombre reality of his impending death. Finally, a coronation is usually attended by heads of state, and it ends with a crowning and an enthronement. On Palm Sunday, no such events occur. The crescendo of his, his journey is his entry into the temple, where he looks around and goes home. If this really was Jesus' coronation, then it was a pretty lame one. His real coronation, I contend, would happen a few days later on Good Friday. You see, I have a theory that Jesus' actual enthronement as King of Kings happens in two parts. Firstly, he has an earthly enthronement, and then there's a secondly, a second, a heavenly enthronement. And not to steal thunder from Good Friday, but they are inexorably linked. It's on Good Friday that we see the entire event is like a macabre, inverted coronation ceremony. <clears throat> you see, our Lord meets foreign heads of state, doesn't he, in the form of Herod and Pontius Pilate, who happens to represent the most powerful human being alive at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he goes on a coronation parade, dragging his cross through Jerusalem up to Golgotha, where he is, in a way, enthroned upon it. He had a crown of thorns prior to that, forcibly put on his head and was mockingly draped in a royal purple robe. Jesus had long predicted the necessity of these events for salvation and he explicitly named his death and his resurrection as the very purpose of his messianic role. Every king or queen has subjects and our King Jesus is no different. And it's through this death and the subsequent resurrection that when people put faith in him, as their means of salvation, he is enthroned on their hearts as Saviour, Lord and King. When sinful humans are called by God and place their faith in Christ, as you and I have done, then we place him on the throne of our hearts. That simply means we swear total loyalty and allegiance to him as our mighty Saviour and everlasting King. Now, yeah, we might stumble and fall in sin as disciples of Christ, but we're always offered the grace to repent and get back on track. Even despite our shortcomings, Jesus remains enthroned in our hearts as king of our faith. We love him because he died for us and rose again. Now I see in scripture that there is also a second heavenly phase to this coronation, and it's hinted at in our Philippians reading, and I think it occurs at his second coming. It's fleshed out in detail in Revelation, and it's the idea that one day God will hand over all authority to Jesus as the ultimate king of the universe. And this happens when Jesus returns. There's the sound of trumpets, the skies peeled back, armies of angels proclaim his glory. He descends as the ultimate king with a crown on his head riding a white horse. Philippians tells us, doesn't it? Every knee in all creation will bow down and acknowledge him as king of kings and lord of lords. That's a, 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 they're short verses, but they have huge implications. Let them rest in your mind for a moment, because it literally means at his return, every living, living human being at the time will bow down in awe of Christ the King. So will every demon and damned soul in hell, every angel and every saved saint in heaven, literally everything in creation will bow down and worship Jesus as King. It's literally going to be the greatest coronation event ever. It's going to make Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth's rather glorious 1954 coronation look like a five-year-old girl's Disney princess party. What does all this mean about Palm Sunday, though? What has it got to do with us and our lives? Well, for you and I, dear friends, it becomes a question of loyalty. Who do we say Jesus is? Is he enthroned in our hearts as king over our lives? Or are we like the confused Jews who have transposed a warped perception of who they wanted their messianic king to be onto Jesus? You know, just like those confused Jews, there are still folks who believe uh, 
in what they want Jesus to be today rather than in the actual Jesus as revealed in the Bible. I was again poking around Google preparing for this sermon and I found an online comic which started off as hilarious and actually ended up crying by the end of it because it described the many fake kings that people worship in place of Jesus. And there was a, a short few examples here. There was Genie Jesus. He grants all your wishes. There was National Rifle Association Jesus, who wanted to give all Americans gun rights and voted for Donald Trump. There was John Lennon Jesus, who was all about peace and love with no judgment. There was Peter Pan Jesus, who was especially fond, uh, beloved by Roman Catholics, because he never grew up and stayed a little baby with a halo forever. There was Angry Macho Man Jesus, who warped the Bible to abuse women. There was Angry Feminist Jesus, who justified abortion and hated men. There was Muslim Jesus, who was just a prophet and a mere servant of Mohammed. And there was Religious Jesus, who was just happy that everyone went to church and they didn't really need to have faith in him. And the list went on and on, and I actually couldn't finish reading it. I was so cut up, and I just skipped to the end. And it ended with this powerful statement, which I think is great to share. All the versions of Jesus in that list have two things in common. Firstly, people actually believe in them. Secondly, they don't exist. Just like the Jews who wanted a warrior king, some folks just have an imaginary friend and they call him Jesus. There is only one true king of the universe, one true saviour, and that's Jesus Christ. And if we want to know him, he reveals himself openly and explicitly from the first page to the last page of the Bible, his word for us. And so it begs the question, doesn't it? Who do we say Jesus is? And it's really the most important question any human being will ever ask themselves. Now, for us as Christian believers who have already given our lives to King Jesus, it continues to have importance in our life, but it's especially important to people who don't yet believe in Jesus. It's the question that hangs large over their lives. You see... For us Christians, it's an imperative, I think, that we spend our lives worshipping Jesus, loving Jesus, adoring Jesus, seeking after Jesus more and more by through prayer and Bible reading and going to church and fellowshipping with other Christians. You can't have enough Jesus in your life. It's impossible to have enough Jesus in your life. And it's also important, I think, as a closing comment, that especially this Easter time, where people's minds are most focused, uh, perhaps on eggs and bunnies, but let's hope on the gospel narrative, it still holds some sway in our culture. Good Friday is still a public holiday, except for the AFL. We ought to be proclaiming the goodness and love of our King Jesus to each other in fellowship and worship, but importantly to others who as yet do not recognise him as King. So I leave that thought with you as we approach Easter and as we honour him as our King this Palm Sunday. In Jesus' name, Amen.